in the upper working classes are very self-improving. They like to keep abreast of uh, developments in politics and in science and the arts and so on. So pretty promising for the industry. The second factor, though, in looking at the press in any country is the law. And since really the Act of Settlement in 1688 and as a result of the... uh, the moderation, the political moderation that um, really was popular after the extremism of of the Civil War of the 17th century, uh, the slow, steady development of a form of parliamentary government, it wasn't in any way democratic uh, in 1800, was it? And it began to to, um, be anything like democratic after the 1830s and really... The working classes didn't get the vote until the 1880s and women didn't get the vote until the 20th century. So the place is not in England is in no way democratic until the 1920s because half the population haven't got the vote. Nevertheless, you have a fairly stable um, liberal political regime where most types of freedom of expression are permitted. There are blasphemy laws uh, and there are libel laws of the type that are still with us today and they take their shape really in the latter part of the 19th century so we have those kind of constraints but there's very little political censorship as such um there was uh you know widespread use of the law of seditious libel um at the time of the french revolution so the end of the 18th century and the very first part of the 19th century uh, Cobbett was done for seditious libel, for example, in uh, you know writing stuff that was very critical of the government might incite a sort of revolution. However, interestingly, um, instead of dealing with this by means of censorship, um, the government suppressed the press, and I think it was a pretty deliberate act of suppression, by levying a tax, a special duty, um, a stamp duty on newspapers, so you had to buy your newspaper for tuppence or whatever, and then you had to pay, I don't know, two shillings at one point on top of that. And that effectively meant the, the press was restricted either to the middle classes or uh, that it was communally consumed. So in those days, uh, a, a newspaper, um, sorry, a pub, an, an inn would buy a newspaper. Um, bit like the way pubs these days have Sky TV for the football and they just have one of these newspapers and they would they would have somebody who would read it out. These people are known as the pothouse oracles. <laughs> they would uh, read the papers up on uh, the, from on the stagecoach maybe at the in the 1810s and 1820s or that had just arrived on the new newfangled steam train in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s and they would have like one copy of of um, the morning advertiser or um, uh, one of the London uh, pages and they, w- they would read it out and people would sit there listening to it just like people you know, watch Sky TV now. So that was how people got round the high cost of newspapers because of the stamp duty. So according to a study by the British Library, um, six or seven hundred newspapers were established locally and nationally between 1800 and 1850. The political breakdown was that 230 or so of them were liberal in inclination. Uh, A smaller number, uh, 174, were conservative. But the rest, and this would be the majority, were either neutral or they were class papers, meaning that they, um, they, they really politically supported the interests of one group or another, so Farmers Weekly would would, would um, politically advocate the interests of farmers, Bootmaker Monthly would, uh, would be in favour of uh, lower taxes on boot manufacturing, you know, as far as politics were concerned. The party system had not really gelled um, uh, in England at that time. Um, it was still pretty much in flux as to who was a conservative, who was a Peelite, who was a liberal, who was a radical, who was a Whig. Um, those categories were still around. The, the modern party political system really only takes its shape 1860s, 1870s, uh, with um, mass organisation of conservative 
uh, Party and uh, Liberal Party. Conservative Party was really the first mass party of the working classes. Uh, but we're going to stick to the press in this lecture and not the development of uh, party, politi party politics in England because we ain't got time. Um, so these, new, on the whole, um, these new newspapers were still uh, regional or provincial. So the expansion of the railway system and the improvement in the roads um, had allowed the characteristic city-based or town-based newspapers of the 18th century to become regional. So the Ipswich Journal, the Oxford Journal, the Hull Packet, Truman's Exeter Flying Post. Uh, these would uh, circulate in areas of, you know, the size of one or two counties. Um, they would include... Um, one or two small towns around them, and sometimes they had sections uh, within them um, headed up for a particular borough or town. You can still see that in local papers. They have a, a page for, for this uh, ward even of the town and that ward of the town. Advertising was the key source of revenue. So you notice uh, in the British Library... Uh, almost like tree rings, years when there was an e economic boom, then people would bring out newspapers quite quickly, like they would now bring out websites, I suppose, uh, in order to try and get some of that advertising revenue. Many of these papers would go bust um, or would be very, very thin during years of economic uh, recession. Um, if you look at these newspapers, they are incredibly, incredibly parochial. I've mentioned that. And there's pages and pages of, uh, of, of just um, church announcements of births, marriages and deaths. Um, every sort of uh, official bit of information that happened within the county would be, be printed. Um, the style of writing hasn't yet taken on the form now that we would recognise, you know, the simple summary intro. Um, eight killed in car smash or something like that. It still is very much like reading some sort of um, official gazette of, of of things that are going on. Revenue from advertisements uh, uh, certainly uh, were important in building up capital to invest in new equipment. And the most important uh, equipment, moving on now to technology, was steam-driven presses. Once you had a steam-driven steam -driven press... Um, you could produce thousands of copies and the economics are transformed. You can sell it, to, you know, pile it high and sell it cheap, basically. But one very important factor in the first half of the 18th century was taxation, um, partly to restrict circulation and partly just to raise money because Britain had been essentially bankrupted by uh, the Napoleonic Wars uh, that's when the income tax was introduced for the first time, for example, in order to pay, just to pay the interest on this enormous national debt that had been accumulated uh, to, to fight the French. So by 1815, and by 1815, the rates of duty on paper, just as a commodity, the raw material uh, that the newspapers were printed on was three pennies in the pound in weight. That was a lot of money in equivalent purchasing power today you'd be talking something in the region of 20 pounds uh, in money per pound of newspaper so if you've ever had a, pa uh, a, a paper round as a, as a child